Welcome, everyone. My name is Bruce Mole, the editor of Commonwealth. Thank you for joining us for a Commonwealth Town Hall <clears throat> exploring the impacts of guaranteed income in partnership with Mass Inc., the Shaw Family Foundation, United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley, and the Cambridge Community Foundation. To kick us off, I'm joined by Mahal Rubin, Vice President of Development at the Cambridge Community Foundation. Take it away, Mihal. Thank you, Bruce. Hi, I'm Michal Rubin, Vice President of the Cambridge Community Foundation. Gita Pradhan, our president, unfortunately cannot be with us today due to a death in the family. We'd like to start by thanking Mass Inc. for convening this important forum. Thank you for the organizers and co-sponsors. Thank you to Commonwealth Magazine, the Shaw Family Foundation, and the United Way. We especially recognize the groundbreaking work that's happening in Chelsea, thanks to the Shaw Family Foundation, the United Way, and the Harvard Rappaport Institute. Your work inspires us and your partnership is invaluable. Thank you also to the Mayors for a Guaranteed Income Initiative and its leader, former Mayor Michael Tubbs, whose vision has sparked a national movement that is impossible to ignore. And thank you to our mayor, Mayor of Cambridge, Sumbul Siddiqui, whose bold out-of-the-box thinking empowered Cambridge to quickly embrace this idea and within a matter of weeks, form a wide partnership, including our multi-stakeholder working group, other nonprofits, our leading universities, Harvard and MIT, the business and life sciences community, philanthropy and residents to establish Cambridge Rise. We share a commitment to raise the income floor for struggling Cambridge families. New research shows what many of us who have worked in the fields have known intuitively for a long time, that people flourish when you give them power and agency. We're very fortunate to have this phenomenal partnership that's come together within just a few weeks. And we sh as we shared the data on income inequality, and as people had just dealt with the impacts of the pandemic, it became really clear that this was a moment for statewide policy as well as national policy. And we're seeing cities lead the way by working together. I have the incredible honor of opening up this conversation today and introducing our keynote speaker, former mayor, Michael Tubbs, the youngest person to serve as mayor of Stockton, California and the first African-American to hold the position. He's a brilliant leader with contagious enthusiasm. We're grateful to be a part of what he started. While he couldn't be with us in person today, Mayor Tubbs has shared his insights with us in the message we're about to see. We're grateful for the work he's done to mainstream what was once a radical idea of giving cash to raise the floor on poverty. Thank you. In 1968, Dr. King spoke about the need for a guaranteed income in his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And in the book, he grapples with what I think many of us have thought over the past decades about the best way to eradicate poverty in our country. And he said after his years of work in the civil rights movement, after his years of work organizing on the ground, after seeing how even with voting rights, and even with desegregation, that poverty still remained a threat to the American dream and entangled with race and racism to create two Americas. He said, we try to solve for poverty by solving for everything else. We try to solve poverty by education, which is important. We try to solve poverty by housing, which is important. We try to solve poverty by job training, which is important, but he said the simplest way to abolish poverty is the most direct, a guaranteed income paid at the national median income in a nation that creates so much wealth and generates so much, um, so much oftentimes for the few. And it's heartening to see 50 plus years later, the conversation being picked up by cities like Chelsea and Cambridge, by foundations like the Shaw Foundations, like states like the state of Massachusetts. We are clearly in a moment where we're understanding that poverty is a choice 
and we can choose differently. We're finally at a moment where we realize that we actually don't need poverty, that poverty serves no, no, no purpose in a civil society, or I would argue in a civilized society. And my advocacy for a guaranteed income, my belief in the power of cash comes from really notions I learned in church about universal basic human dignity, about the fact that dignity is not attached to one's production. Dignity is not attached to one's work because that's far too limiting of a definition for people who stay at home, for people who are differently able, and for people who work in jobs that don't give them the dignity of unions, that don't give them the dignity of paid wa of wages that pay for rent, that don't give them even the dignity of having a schedule that's stable. But dignity, in fact, has to be has to be connected to one's humanity first. And when we see all people, rich people, poor people, black people, Latino people, Asian people, men, women, trans people, when we see all people as deserving dignity, then we have to ask certain questions. One of them being, if all people have dignity, how does that show up? And how do we allow people to live in poverty, which is literally the opposite of dignity, the opposite of security, and the opposite of what's necessary for brain development, what's necessary to be fully human, and what's necessary to actually contribute your, the fullness of oneself to civil society. In 2017, I was even younger. I was a 27-year-old mayor and working with the Economic Security Project, announced that we were going to do a guaranteed income pilot in the city of Stockton, California. 2017 seems like a decade ago, if not more. The world was so different. The dominant conversation was not about how do we end poverty. The dominant conversation was not about we can trust people with money. The dominant conversation was not about sort of, there was no stimulus checks. There were no presidential candidates running on universal basic income. And it was in that moment we looked out and said, you know what? We don't have to have poverty. That if we fix poverty, all the other problems that we care about are actually easier to solve. If we fix the root, then we can make sure we're growing in roses, not from concrete as Tupac talked about, but from fertile soil and rose bushes where they're supposed to grow in, in, in the first place. And when we announced in Stockton, so many of the tropes I heard, I argued with Sarah Palin and Chuck Woolery on Twitter. I argued with people from economists to, um, governors to, to presidential people, like all these folks who are saying this 27 year old knows nothing and that you just can't give people money. But now we see for just four, just four years later that giving people money is probably the smartest thing we can do. It represents contingency planning. It represents pandemic preparedness as we learn, and it represents a sound investment strategy. And one that recognizes that the most important investment we can make is actually an investment in our people. The most important investments we can make are actually upstream investments. And thanks to the work of you all and the work of Mayors for Guaranteed Income, which is now 55 mayors strong, and, and the work of advocates and activists and thinkers from the inception of our country with Thomas Paine until now, we have a federal guaranteed income of some sort with this child tax credit that's guaranteed, that's monthly, to every family making 75K or below. And we just have to make that permanent and fight for that and then extend it to all the other folks that we know a guaranteed income works for. So when we did the pilot in stock and there was no data, which is why we thought it was more no contemporary data. But that's what we thought was so important to, to, to do the pilot and do it in a very public way. And what we saw is what you guys are seeing in Chelsea, what you guys will see in Cambridge, et cetera. You can trust people with money. The issue isn't that people don't know how to manage money. The issue, the core issue is that people don't have enough money to manage. The, the issue is not that people don't want to work and want the government to do everything. The issue is that poverty robs people of opportunity and agency. The economic insecurity takes up so much brain space and that people are working themselves literally to death with nothing to show for it. People are literally working two or three jobs, doing all the jobs that no one on this call wants to do and still can't pay for food, still staying in line in food lines like we saw in Chelsea, still spending the majority of their money on food like we saw in, in, in Stockton. We, we, we also saw that a guaranteed income actually unlocks potential, 
that those who received a guaranteed income were two times more likely than those who didn't to move from part-time to full-time work and two times less likely to be unemployed after receiving money. The money didn't make people lazy. The money didn't make people not want to contribute. The money, in fact, removed barriers to contributions and barriers to stable employment for those who wanted to work. We also saw the health benefits that those who received the guaranteed income were happier, were healthier, were less stressed, were able to do all the things we know we need people to do. Like why we literally form government, like political science one-on-one. -on -one. In this dystopian world where everyone fends for themselves, the philosophers of old already told us that life is nasty, brutish, and short. And that literally defines the life of living in poverty. I know that as someone who was born in poverty. It's not fun, it's brutish, and it has a shorter life expectancy than those who don't. Life is nasty, brutish, brutish and short. But what we saw with the guaranteed income is sort of what the philosophers of old thought of when they talked about entering a social contract that providing everyone the economic security, just a floor, not a mansion, not even the whole house, just a floor, just a foundation was enough to allow people to self-actualize, to allow people to contribute, and again, to allow people to do the things we form government and society to do. Be good partners, good parents, and good participants in civil society, good neighbors. So I am so heartened by this conversation that's happening in the state of Massachusetts and know that you are not alone, that you are a part of a national conversation. In California, we're having a convening with all the California mayors who are doing guaranteed income pilots. We have $35 million in the state budget to, to support tests and pilot. Um, we have Newark, New Jersey. We have New Jersey. We have a coalition of mayors, as I mentioned, throughout this country, including my good friend, the mayor of Cambridge, Mayor Siddiqui including my good friend, city manager of the city of Chelsea, um, who are really pushing the envelope and pushing a conversation forward, a conversation forward that is so simple. And it's really this. Do you trust your neighbor to make good decisions like you would trust yourself? And as a person of faith, I think that's part of an expression of what the Bible teaches us in terms of love your neighbor as yourself in terms of doing to others as you would have them doing to you. In terms of um, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was in poverty, did you help me get an income floor? I, I literally think even the wisdom of scripture teaches us that this idea of mutual, mutuality, this idea that we're all linked, it, it is one that has to manifest in the sorts of policies we advocate. That what's good for me, what's good for you. I think particularly in this moment where we're wrestling with Black Lives Matter, when we're wrestling with, with legacies of white supremacy, we have to also have a conversation about how so much of the ideologies, how so much of the tropes we have are rooted in racism and anti-Blackness. This idea that people think that by giving people money, they're gonna buy, spend things, spend money on things like liquor and Air Jordans and, and, and methanol cigarettes is racist. It's, it's racist. This idea that people who receive guaranteed income are lazy or who people are, are lazy is racist. And we've seen the consequences in the policy world of racist tropes underpinning policy making. We see it in the vagrancy laws after the abolition of slavery, where again, folks said, well, black people are lazy. If they're not working, they're lazy. They need to work, they need to work for share crop for free. And if they're standing loitering around looking for work, let's arrest them. And again, have free labor. We, we, we see the consequences of racist policy in the past 400 years of the democratic experiment thinking that people are somehow deficient, deficit-based versus asset-based policy -based. And guaranteed income represents a break from that racist past, a break from that deficit-focused past, and really represents a path forward. But no, it is not a panacea. No, it is not a magic bullet. But to answer the question of this conference, it is absolutely a good policy. Show me another policy that leads to better health outcomes, better employment outcomes, um, better feelings of self-actualization, um, and also helps the economy with, with, with consumer spending. Show me one. Show me one, one. Show me one policy that gives does all that and gives workers more agency and gives women makes a more feminist economy by, by honoring the unpaid contributions of women. 
that sees caregivers and sees folks who are differently able and sees students and sees artists as all worthy and contributors deserving of some investment from government. Show me one. You can't. And that's why this conversation is so important. So I'm honored to be part of part in the struggle with you all and looking forward to making Dr. King's dream and our dream, the American dream, uh, a reality in this generation. Again, thank you. Michael Tubbs here, founder of Marriage from Gary Team Income and former mayor of the city of Stockton, California. And now we turn to a guaranteed income experiment that took place in Chelsea, Massachusetts. The city of Chelsea last year piloted the first guaranteed income program Massachusetts has ever seen called Chelsea Eats. Participants received direct cash assistance in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis that had hit the city especially hard. The Harvard Kennedy School's Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston analyzed the program and released its initial findings in the spring. Joining us now to discuss some of those findings is the data team's lead research, researcher, Jeff Liebman, the Malcolm Weiner Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Jeff? Thank you. Give me just one second to get this slide going here. All right. Uh, thanks so much. I would argue that the Chelsea Eats program is important for four reasons. The first is that it's an extraordinary example of policy innovation in the midst of a health and economic crisis. The second is that it's an important reminder that our safety net in the United States and here in Massachusetts remains full of holes and that new solutions to our poverty and hunger problems are needed. Third, uh, the project is really the first US proof that it's feasible to do the kinds of direct payments uh, that the mayor just described uh, at community-wide scale. In Chelsea, 2,000 households uh, were assisted, which is much larger than the 125 or so that has occurred in most of the guaranteed income pilots. And because Chelsea is a relatively small city, 2,000 households is 12% of Chelsea households. And so it really is uh, the first proof that we can do this uh, at a community-wide scale. And then the last thing uh, that's important about this is because the program is, is large uh, with several thousand people involved in it, um, there's much more opportunity than in most of these pilots to actually learn the impacts. And that's where I, where I come in. So let me explain what Chelsea Eats is, what we've learned so far in our research uh, and what we will ultimately be measuring. Chelsea is among the places in the US that was hardest hit by COVID-19 both from a health and an economic standpoint. It's an Im immigrant community with high population density and lots of people who were in frontline service workers who didn't have the option of staying home and doing their work over Zoom. By April of 2020, 32% of Chelsea residents tested at a mobile site already had SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, the, hard, the highest fraction measured anywhere in the country at that point. Because so many Chelsea workers were in sectors of the economy that shut down, restaurant work, cleaning downtown office buildings and many other jobs, the official unemployment rate rose from 3% in February to 25% in June. And for a variety of reasons that almost certainly understates the job loss. And many of those unemployed workers were ineligible for unemployment insurance and stimulus checks because of their immigration status. So overnight, you had a ton of people who suddenly had zero income and no ability to pay for food, much less for rent or utilities. The city of Chelsea and local community organizations mounted an extraordinary food distribution effort, one that at its height was feeding more than 10,000 people a week. But after doing this for about five weeks, Tom Ambrosino, the city manager, asked if there might be a better way, uh, uh, sorry, for five months, he asked whether there might be a better way to provide relief uh, and working with community members, several of whom you'll hear from in a few minutes, he set up the Chelsea Eats program that provides households with a Visa debit card so that they can do their own shopping at grocery stores or wherever else they want to shop rather than standing in line to receive a box of food from the city. Um, so, uh, so that's the context. Um, here's a picture of the uh, card people receive. 
And uh, most cards are receiving $400 a month. They started receiving these cards in late November. Uh, smaller households receive uh, smaller uh, amounts and they can spend the cards anywhere they want. Uh, they don't have to spend them uh, at grocery stores or on food, uh, but as you will see in a moment, most, uh, mo most have. So they can spend these cards anywhere that, that Visa is, is, is accepted. Um, the, when they set up this program, uh, there were more people interested than they had funding to, to assist. Uh, they had, they had uh, enough money to assist 2,000 families, which is a tremendous amount, uh, but 3,600 applied. Uh, the way they recruited families was basically uh, going up and down the lines at the food pantries with a uh, tablet computer and taking applications. So because there were more people who uh, applied uh, than they had cards for, they held a lottery as the fair way to allocate this. And they actually broadcast this live lottery uh, live on Facebook, on the city's Facebook page. And I took a screenshot of this. Uh, it's still there. I took a screenshot this morning of it so I could share it with you. And so any of you who have, who have uh, finished uh, binge watching uh, the second season of, of Lupin already and are looking for something uh, engaging to watch, you can go watch the lottery for half an hour on their, on their face, uh, Facebook page. Uh, and so they had a lottery and 2,000 families or so uh, got the cards. Uh, uh, the rest didn't. Uh, and because of this lottery, it creates a, a, a platform where I can do uh, research uh, because you can compare the people who won the lottery to the ones who were unsuccessful. Uh, they're identical, except uh, that some got a card and some didn't. Uh, and that allows you to do the, the research to study the impacts. So what we've been doing as a research team is we uh, first surveyed uh, households before they knew their lottery status. Um, so we did a baseline survey uh, in September to, to, to see how they were doing. Uh, about two thirds of the households that entered the lottery uh, joined, our, joined our research study. Um, and uh, ever since that first baseline study, we've been interviewing the families about every uh, six weeks to eight weeks. Uh, and so we checked in with them again uh, later in the fall, uh, again in December, again in February. Uh, then in March, uh, we checked in with them with a very simple survey, which was simply to tell us everything they ate in the previous 24 hours so that we can see how access to these cards uh, affects um, people's diet. Uh, and then we just uh, are, are just wrapping up uh, data collection on the, on, on, on the final uh, survey. And then in a couple months, uh, we will be releasing a report on the experimental impacts. Uh, we're also uh, using administrative data. Uh, uh, we have da uh, anonymous data, um, both on um, uh, where people spent uh, the, the $400 uh, cards. And we also have anonymous data on uh, the school attendance of children, uh, both in the families that received cards and the ones that didn't. And so we'll be able to look at school uh, attendance uh, out outcomes. So what we're trying to measure in this study um, really are, are, are four big things uh, and, and then a couple other things that sort of come, come, come for free. Um, the, the most important is the direct impact uh, of receiving income on people's uh, ability to uh, meet daily expenses on whether they can afford enough food, whether they're getting evicted, uh, things like that. Uh, the second category of things we're measuring are things that you sort of think of as possible downstream effects of having more income. Uh, mental health, uh, access to medical care, uh, the school attendance, I would put in that category, uh, think things like that. Uh, we're, we're measuring the impact on, on people's diets, as I mentioned. Uh, and then we're measuring a lot of things, uh, a lot of economic outcomes um, things that I like to describe as things that if I didn't measure them, I would get excommunicated as an economist. Uh, impact on work, impact on uh, uh, asset levels, impact on uh, remitt remittances to family members uh, overseas, uh, things like that. Uh, and then we're doing some other stuff that, that is helpful uh, in, in the midst of the, the, the context we're in to be helpful to the city and uh, assessing things like internet access uh, for, for, for their students. Um, so let me just give you a, a sense of our sample um, from uh, the uh, baseline survey. Uh, you can see that uh, most people uh, who responded are female, which I think suggests that people who were doing the picking up of the food boxes for their families tended to be female. Uh, you can see we have uh, about 6% who are, who are over 65. Uh, you can see this is a heavily uh, Latino uh, population. Uh, and you can see to the right of this panel uh, that uh, the majority of these households have children and you can, and you can see the household size uh, distribution. Um, so um, uh, I, I mentioned that this community was incredibly hit from a health uh, perspective. And so when we surveyed them in September and asked whether the person themselves uh, had had COVID or whether anybody else in their household had had COVID, 
a remarkable 32% of households contain at least one person who'd been sick with COVID, which, which again, it's just, I mean, I just haven't seen any other sample like that. It's just an extraordinary amount of, 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 of health impacts of this crisis. When we asked whether the, the, anybody in the household had had a financial hardship in, in the past, in, 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 in the past year, you know, the overwhelming majority had, and we asked them when we asked what that hardship was, a lot of it was job loss or reduced hours. The price increases for food that people experienced in the first sort of six months of the COVID crisis were a huge burden for these, for these households. You can see 19% had had a health emergency, 5% had had a death, a death of a household member. You know, the, 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 the COVID experience here was, was, was really, really quite intense. And these economic shocks, the job loss was carrying through to real food insecurity. So this, this slide shows what is the standard one question way to assess food insecurity in the US. We also administer a longer, a longer version of this in our, in our research. And what it does is it breaks people down into four categories. The category you want to be in is you have enough food and it's the kind of food you want to eat. And that's the top row. The second category is you have enough food, but you don't have what you want to eat. Maybe you can't afford your usual food. Maybe you're getting food from a food pantry that isn't culturally appropriate, but at least you have enough to eat. The bottom two categories are where you don't want to be. Sometimes not enough to eat or often not enough to eat. And you can see when we interviewed this population in September, just about half of the population sometimes or often was not getting enough to eat. I mean, that's just, you know, I just have never seen a US population with this much food insecurity. And just as a comparison, the exact same question has been asked by the Census Bureau every week in the midst of COVID, and they give you those results by state. And so I can show you in the bottom what those numbers look like for everyone in Massachusetts. And in contrast to the 49% of the Chelsea sample that was sometimes or often not having enough to eat, you can see in Massachusetts why that number was 5.5 plus 1.8. So about a little over 7% who didn't have enough to eat. So this is just off the charts food insecurity. You can also see as we continue to interview these families over time, there was still a very large amount of food insecurity, but it was getting better. And so a combination of the cards and what the community groups and the city have been doing to try to meet this food crisis do seem to be having some impact over time. This slide just shows you that this food insecurity carries over to children. And again, you just see remarkable levels of remarkably high levels of food insecurity among children, children who weren't getting enough food to eat because the family couldn't afford enough food. This slide shows what is actually the first question we ask in every survey, which is, would you say that you're better off or worse off financially than you were last month? And at the beginning of at the beginning of this sample, September, you know, these are families that were doing so poorly that they're standing in line to get boxes of food. Still, six months from this crisis, things were still getting worse. 50% were saying they were worse off than the month before, only 7% were better off. And that was starting from a base that wasn't so hot. And there were still things were still getting worse. And you can see going forward, going further into the year, it was still the case that as we asked this question that more families were describing their situation as getting worse than getting better each month. And right around February is where I think things finally balanced. And so the way I was describing this when I was talking about this around February was that over time, things were still getting worse for these families because they still didn't have their jobs back. They might have had part of their hours back and they were getting further and further into debt. But at least they weren't getting worse at quite the same rate as they were earlier in the crisis. I think somewhere around March, these families actually started to be doing a little bit better than the previous month. And this flipped a bit. OK, so the last thing I want to show you in terms of the results we have so far is where people are spending their $40 Chelsea Eats cards. And so this we put out a report on this. And so what we have access to is anonymized data on where every one of you know, when people went and spent their Visa cards, what stores were they spent at? 
I can't tell what they bought at those stores, but I can tell what the stores were. And what you can see is that almost half of the card spending is happening at grocery stores. In fact, a third of it is happening at a single grocery store, the, the market basket uh, in, 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 in Chelsea. Um, uh, but you can see the other, other, other uh, big uh, local grocery stores. Uh, another 12% is happening at the big wholesale clubs. Uh, where, where people can buy bulk, uh, you know, food at, 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 at a reasonable cost. Uh, and then another 12% uh, um, uh, is split between uh, markets and convenience stores, like the local meat markets and produce markets, uh, and at restaurants and, and, uh, and, and, and food delivery. Um, so overall, almost three quarters of, you know, these cards can be spent on any, anything, but almost three quarters of the dollars are being spent on, 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 on food. Uh, which um, uh, I guess in some sense is not that surprising given that we're studying folks who uh, uh, were struggling to afford food. Uh, the other thing that comes out of studying the card data is you can see uh, what uh, fraction of the spending stays local. Uh, so more than half of the dollars got spent locally uh, with, with, within, uh, with, at, at, at places within Chelsea, um, uh, about 56%. Uh, you can see there again, the, the market basket being the, the symbol, single largest place. Um, and, uh, but a, uh, a fair amount was spent in some of the neighboring communities, particularly the neighbor, neighboring communities where the closest wholesale club uh, uh, stores were. Uh, um, so, all right. Um, so uh, this last thing I'll say is we've put out two reports so far uh, on, on, uh, on, on what we've uh, learned and, and, and that overlaps with what I just talked about today. Uh, you can find those on, our, on the Rappaport Institute uh, website. Jeff, uh, thanks so much. That, that was extremely interesting. Uh, before we move on to the panel discussion, I have a few questions I wanna ask you, but I also wanna at this point to encourage our audience members to please make use of the Q&A function in this Zoom. Um, we will have a question and answer portion at the end of the event. So input, input your questions as we go along and we'll be sure to do our best to answer as many as we can. So Jeff, um, Help us get oriented here in a sort of policy sense. Um, as I was preparing for this, I was reading about guaranteed income, universal basic income, and other names for all which sort of seem to be revolving around the same topic. Can you sort that out for us? What are what do these different terms mean, and and what are their policy implications? Sure, I, I, and I agree with you that that the uh, these terms are definitely confusing, and, and and maybe some of this debate is a little confused. Um, so I would say um, there are really, th I think, three concepts that I think most of the what people are talking about fit into. Um, one is sort of the Andrew Yang style, give everyone in America a, a big amount of money. Uh, if you do that, you have to raise a massive amount of tax revenue. Um, and um, uh, it's unclear whether something like that is truly, truly feasible. The second idea that's out there is um, something that really has its roots uh, back in the Nixon administration with the family assistance plan, uh, economists tend to call it a negative income tax, where you give uh, someone who has no other income uh, a significant amount of income, um, you know, maybe something like $15,000 a year, but you phase out how much one gets as their income rises, maybe at a 50% rate. So if you earn $10, you lose $5 of the benefit. And so maybe it's the, the people who are getting assistance um, and are getting it on a sliding scale, get it only up to like $30,000 of income or something like that. So you're targeting this guaranteed income, this negative income tax uh, at, 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 at people uh, who, who have the greatest uh, uh, need. The, the third, I think, idea that's out there is that there are some well-defined populations. You might say the homeless, you might say children aging out of foster care, people using food pantries, who we just know we wanna help everyone in that population. And then maybe the best way to help them is by giving them uh, steady cash for some period of time, one year, two years, three years with no strings attached, with no, you know, our, our, our current, you know, uh, means tested public programs. If you make more money, they take away your benefit. Uh, you know, if you start to build up some money uh, in, a, in a bank account and, and, and accumulate any assets, they take away your benefits. Having some no strings attached cash for a bunch of years for some populations that are well enough targeted that you don't have to worry too much about whether or not uh, people might take advantage of the program and wrongly be, you know, people who don't have need might be using it. Uh, uh, I, I think that's the third idea out there. Uh, and, and so I think this discussion, this, this, this conversation everyone's having is, you know, somewhere between all of those three things at different points in time. And there's, there's talk, you hear, heard it in Michael Tubbs' remarks, he talked about eradicating poverty. 
but he also referred to these um, payments, monthly payments, as the floor. Uh, it's not the mansion. It's not even the whole house. It's or a room in the house. It's it's the floor. Put it a little in context. These payments stabilize. I think that's what you're trying to look at is sort of what impact it has on spending, but also on their attitudes about work and all sorts of things. Put it in perspective. Are these enough to change people's, these payments enough to change people's lives? I think that's what we're going to discover from, from the research, not only ours, but the other ones going on around the country. Um, you know, anecdotally, when you talk to these families, I mean, they're telling us stories about the payments making the difference between eating you know, rice and beans every day or getting to have meat once a week. And they're making the difference between whether they actually, you know, their kids are actually getting three meals a day rather than two meals a day. And so it's pretty hard to imagine that's not changing people's lives when, when you're having that kind of impact on whether people can even um, uh, afford to eat. But we will have to, you know, we'll have to wait to, to, to see what we can measure in the, in, 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 in the research. You know, the other thing you, you referred to is, is um, people's uh, interest in working, which is something the mayor referred to as well. I mean, I, I didn't spend time on this in the, in the presentation, but there was extraordinary unemployment in this population. And just about everyone was looking for a job. Um, and everyone who had a job wanted more hours. And so, you know, the idea that uh, somehow the, these kind of uh, programs are inconsistent uh, with work uh, certainly doesn't apply to the Chelsea context. Okay, Jeff, hang on. We're going to have some questions from our audience later on, but right now I want to turn to our panelists. Um, and let me introduce them. We're joined today by Tom Ambrosino, the city manager of the city of Chelsea. Sarah Arman, the Health Equity Corps Coordinator at Green Roots, Sambol Siddiqui, the Mayor of the City of Cambridge, and Bob Giannino, President and CEO of the United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley. Welcome to you all. So let's start with you, Tom. Um, as I understand it, this whole initiative in Chelsea grew out of a practical problem you, you were needed to solve. You had lots of people who needed food and you were getting it out the door every day through food pantries and what have you. And you were looking for a new way to do that, deal with that problem. Walk us through your thinking about how this whole thing came about, if you could. So as you mentioned, we were, we were involved in an extraordinary food distribution effort for the first few months of COVID. Uh, we had two pantries, the city had two pantries a day operating for a couple of months and then we ramped down to one. But we were spending an extraordinary amount of personnel resources and money, uh, money on non-food related items. We were spending a lot of money on transporting food from one place to another. We were spending money on temporary employees to break down pat large pallets of food into smaller boxes. We were spending money on boxes and pallets. And uh, so, and I was using a lot of city employees to do this work and it just couldn't, wasn't feasible to keep that going as a municipality. Second thing is that it was obvious to me that this was really an undignified way for people to meet their needs. I would look out my window at City Hall on a hot, hot summer day, and there would be a line that wrapped around the building and, you know, uh, frail elderly people waiting in the hot sun for two hours just at the end to be handed a heavy box of food that most of them had to carry because few had automobiles back to their house two, three, four blocks away, even longer. So all of that led us to think there had to be a more humane way to meet this need and one that would be beneficial to our residents. And so we came up, we, we, you know, the obvious idea was let's figure out a way to just get these people money to go buy their own food and meet their own needs uh, as they saw fit. And so we started to pursue this debit card effort. So Tom, the, um, it, it solves a practical problem, but I don't think there were many other city officials around the country. Now, Chelsea may have been one of the hardest hit as we heard from Jeff, but no other, I'm not aware of too many other municipal officials that responded the way Chelsea did. Um, that was a sort of major leap forward, whether it was practical or policy oriented or whatever, you just were trying to solve a problem. It's, 
why why do you think it was so unique in 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 the United States? You know, I do think that there was uniqueness in the level of food insecurity here. We were clearly among the hardest hit in the nation in terms of the amount of people both who were impacted health-wise by COVID and the large amounts of people who had no source of income. I mean, as Jeff noted, a lot of the people waiting in food lines were uh, undocumented or worked non-traditional jobs. They were not eligible for any kind of government assistance during the summer, no uh, form of unemployment benefits. So lots of people really had zero income coming in. And it was just, I think the magnitude of the problem made Chelsea quite unique and required us to have a unique response. Sarah, um, you're very familiar with the people who participated in this program. Um, paint a word picture if you can for, uh, for us about, describe them. What kind of situation were, were they in and what was their attitude toward the money they received? Can you fill us in on that? Thanks, Bruce. Um, yeah, so I've been working with a number of Chelsea Eats Card recipients through an initiative to close the SNAP gap. And what the SNAP gap is, is the difference between the number of low-income Chelsea residents who are eligible for SNAP and those who actually apply and end up receiving it. Um, so what we did here at Green Roots was reach out to everyone who applied to the Chelsea East card and had like one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, asking them if had they known about SNAP, would they be interested in applying? And so through those one-on-one -on -one conversations with the Chelsea East cards recipients, it, we, it really illuminated the impact that this card had on people's day-to-day -day lives. There's this one recipient who I was talking to who has teenage daughters, and she was saying that the card helps her buy shampoo and conditioner and sanitary and hygiene products. These are things that she wasn't really able to buy before, and you can't really find them at food pantry lines or really anywhere else. So, and, and the, the, the notion of getting cash and having the flexibility to do that, was that empowering or, uh, or as, as Mr. Ambrosino says, he said it was sort of, um, a poor situation of waiting in line, long lines for food, and, and the cash seemed to be a, or a, a card seemed to be a better way to do it. Was that confirmed by your discussions with, with these folks? Yeah, I think so. I think empowering is actually the exact right word to use for this situation. Um, I think the important thing about Chelsea Eats is that it really was like, it is an investment in, in community members, not just through money, but like through giving them trust and agency as well. And to telling people, we trust that you're making the right decisions for you and your family. We know that you ultimately know what's best for yourselves. And I think one really good example is that for the number that Jeff shared air earlier, that 6.9% of Chelsea Eats money that was used at restaurants, like, yes, this is going out to eat at a local restaurant, but it's also dinner to celebrate a family member or a friend's birthday. It's the money that was used at Macy's and other department stores is buying new clothes and shoes for students who are going back to in-person learning after months of virtual learning. So I think ultimately people know what they need um, for themselves and for their families. So Bob, uh Talk a little bit about what role the United Way played in the Chelsea Eats initiative and what role you think nonprofits play in, in, in this broader debate about guaranteed income. Thanks so much, Bruce. Uh, it's great to be with everyone today and to be a part of this uh, tremendous program. Um, I, I think there's two kind of uh, points of genesis for this work. One was personal in a lot of ways. Um, I grew up uh, not too far from Chelsea, uh, spent most of my younger years in Somerville and in Everett. Uh, my mom uh, was on public benefits, has been on public benefits uh, my entire adult life, uh, navigating uh, SNAP, Section 8, and so many other benefits, uh, uh, and trying to do that in a way that um, is, you know, uh, uh, is easy for a poor person, doesn't require that they uh, prove themselves uh, to be poor constantly, uh, can be very undignifying uh, and, uh, and, and really create a lot of uh, heartache in a family. And so I saw that firsthand. And, and so as this idea was coming together, um, you know, being able to marry that personal point with the work that United Way was involved with from the very beginning in the pandemic of working uh, in the city of Chelsea, we had uh, worked with a number of of local community agencies in the city of Chelsea to set up the, the One Chelsea Fund 
uh, at the very beginnings of the pandemic, uh, working with, uh, with Tom, with La Collaborativa, with Green Roots, with uh, the neighborhood developers uh, to, to address those initial needs that had arose. And then we saw an opportunity. And I think this is why um, uh, United Way really wanted to step into this, uh, to this initiative with Chelsea Eats was we saw an opportunity to create a new way of, of addressing the immediate need that existed, the, the, the hunger and food insecurity and, and so much else that was uh, being faced by residents in Chelsea, but also to dive in to think about how might we use this once in a generation opportunity to reimagine how we meet the needs of our most vulnerable residents, how we empower communities to emerge stronger and more equitable and prepared for the future. Uh, and the work that uh, in our partnership with the Shaw Foundation, um, with Mass General Hospital, with the city of Chelsea, uh, and with a number of other donors who had pitched in has brought nearly $2 million to this effort um, over the last year. Um, and, and with Jeff's research and the work of the Kennedy School, we do believe that we're emerging from this, not only having helped many families navigate this moment in time, but also with some really important ideas about how we might rethink that social safety net and ensure that families like mine um, may actually be able to get the support that they need from uh, public and private sectors in a dignified way that enables agency and opportunity. So Mayor Siddiqui, uh, you're launching a guaranteed income initiative in Cambridge this August uh, with 120 low-income families. And it's part of um, what has been referred to many times as the Mayors for a Guaranteed Income Initiative. What are you hoping to accomplish with this, with this program? Sure, uh, thanks for the question. And it's great to be here with uh, the fellow panelists. So I think myself and many of the mayors, uh, part of MGI, we're on a mission to really amass a body of evidence that demonstrates that guaranteed income, I think is the best um, investment you can make in human potential. Uh, and as Mayor Tubbs and many other mayors have said, I think poverty is a policy fa failure uh, and not a personal Failure. And so uh, I think really the goal, um, as others have said, uh, is to show how um, cash um, is powerful, how it will have an impact. Um, we have some data, um, but we are on a mission to amass even more data and narrative, really changing the narrative um, about poverty. Uh, and so I think our Cambridge Rise a reoccurring income for success and empowerment. Uh, that's really the fundamental component. And, and Mayor, um, so you're gathering information, you're trying to understand how this works better. Where do you see it going down the road? Do you see this spreading to other communities? Do you see the state government getting involved, federal government? I mean, let your imagination run wild. What are you, what are you hoping happens? I think it's uh, it, it's a little bit of both. Um, it's fundamentally, absolutely, let's see what we can do on the national level, the state level, um, and then look locally uh, about how um, what this this project shows um, and this pilot shows for our uh, residents and those participating. So I think uh, as MGI, uh, as we'll show, we have so many cities in really various states, you know. Uh, various municipalities across the country um, that are running pilots, whether it's for, um, you know, for young people, for those in foster care, for aging out of foster care, for single caretakers, which is the case in Cambridge. Um, it is really to amass this body, body of evidence that can shape national policy. I think uh, many cities either don't have the means uh, to, to gather <clears throat> the money for pilots like these. They're all privately funded in Cambridge. Uh, and in many cities. So the goal would be really, how does government then take the lead? Uh, how do we have government um, play a role? Uh, and these policies, <clears throat> these pilots will really certainly, the goal is to, to, to use those to advocate for uh, a national policy. Bob, uh, why don't you tackle that a little bit too? You were starting to go up to it in your answer to the initial question, but where do you see this going? Do you 
you hope uh, you, you get the data you need to convince government agencies to get involved? And if so, walk me through, I mean, we do have a lot of government support programs that exist already. Is this displacing them, adding to them? How do you, how do you see it working? Yeah, I, I think that one of the roles of philanthropy is to point out promising ideas, to measure the impact and the effects of those ideas through the work that Jeff is doing, and then take those learnings to policymakers and system leaders and advocate for new ways forward. We, we have to believe that the way we've been doing it for the last 50 or 60 years since the launch of the war on poverty, we've, we've lost the war. Um, it's time to rethink how we deploy supports to people who need them. And, and my, my hope and desire is that, you know, this and many of the other pilots will point out a number of ways that we might rethink how benefits are deployed, um, offered, how they interact with one another. One of the things that I said earlier about my mom is, you know, my mom every year right now as an 80 year old still has to prove that she's poor to get her Section 8 housing, to get her SNAP benefits. She has to do that one at a time. Um, so imagine if we could recreate a system and, and think about the, the spend on the public sector to manage all of that means testing and deployment of benefits. There has got to be a more efficient and effective way to, to do this. And I truly believe that what we're seeing in some of the early results that Jeff has shown is that giving people money just like the mayor said earlier, uh, Mayor Tubb said earlier, giving people money will lead to them making the right decisions for their families. So yes, let's rethink whether or not we need um, I think uh, <laughs> I think Bob's froze they on my screen. the way that they are, and maybe the other half that they need. I don't have the specific answer. But that's my thoughts uh, that might uh, that might come from it. Sarah, uh, in your discussions with people who participated in this program, what about all the red tape that they have to comply with to participate in current support programs? Is it talk a little bit about that? Is that a is it a major hurdle for people? Yeah, I think so, and I think that's one of the reasons why we see such a large SNAP gap or accessing other benefits in Chelsea is that people aren't aware what the rules are. People find it hard to even collect for SNAP, for example, you need to show proof of income. It's hard to find all of those documents. People don't know where they are. Um, so it kind of dis disincentivizes them from accessing these resources. And Mr. Ambrosino, um, so you took the leap, some might call it a heroic leap to, to, to hand out these cards and, and issue cash to people. Um, in a practical sense, what do you hope, uh, do you hope this continues indefinitely or can, can the city afford to do it even with support from, you know, private groups? What are you looking to the future? What do you think? So our goal is just get people through this emergency. So this is not intended at least at the city level to go on indefinitely. It's an extraordinarily expensive program for local government, so it's not sustainable for local government. So in the short term, our goal is let's get these 2,000 families through this emergency, and I feel like we've accomplished that, or we're about to accomplish that. The program will end at the end of the summer. But our, our other goal was let's prove that a program like this works. Let's prove that, let's prove the things that we are almost certain will be the case, that it will improve people's economic health and mental health, that people will spend their money responsibly. Just because people are poor doesn't mean that they're irresponsible, that they're lazy. And third, let's prove through the surveying work that this is not a disincentive for people to work, that these people will still be seeking uh, employment and to uh, improve their lives. And I think we will prove all three of those things. And I think that will allow us to advocate for a program like this supported at the state and national level where it, it, it must be supported. And have you had any discussions with officials at the state or national level about, oh, we really like this program. How can we transform it into a state program? Have Has that happened yet or is it too early? I. 
I have not. I don't think it's too early. I think some of the preliminary findings that Professor Liebman has identified show uh, are being used to advocate, but it's certainly my hope that this will be a strong argument to be made in the ensuing months. I would, if I could, just want to add one thing that Sarah mentioned about barriers. One of the things that we, we proved is that to make the program effective, it has to have very low barriers to entry. Our application was one page long. It was 12 simple questions. The, we didn't require any proof. It was self-attestation. Tell us that you're, tell us how many people in your family that what you earn for income and if you qualify, you're in the law. So one last thing on that point, uh, I'm, I'm sort of channeling people who are listening and probably a little skeptical about this. Uh, I think Jeff pointed out that Chelsea was in a very rough shape uh, during the COVID crisis. Uh, huge, what did he say? Off the charts food insecurity. Is this, does that distort the results of what he's finding in the research or does that, uh, I, I guess what I'm wondering if, if the economy was different, if there was no pandemic, how would this program have worked? It's impossible to say obviously, but it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is you launched it to solve a practical problem. It's now being thought of as maybe a, a long-term uh, answer. Do you agree with that? I do because the level of food insecurity that existed in Chelsea before the pandemic was extraordinary. It was just hidden. And that's true in a lot of communities. The pandemic brought this to light, the level of food insecurity and poverty that exists in, in America, it's really appalling for a nation of our wealth. And I think it's time that we as Americans do something. And Mayor Siddiqui, um, Cambridge is often thought of as this um, biotech capital of the world, uh, very, I mean, most people don't even think about going there because it's so expensive to get housing and what have you. Uh, it's it's maybe a little surprising to some people. Clearly, there are people that are in need in Cambridge, and that's what you're trying to address. But this is one of probably the wealthier communities in the state, I would think. Um, what does it say that you're launching this program in Cambridge? It, it is wealthy, uh, but it is a tale of two cities. Uh, I think we have a hyper concentration of wealth and poverty in Cambridge. Our highest earners you know, make more than $300,000 a year uh, and our lowest earners are making 13,000 annually. Um, and, you know, a personal background similar to what Bob said, you know, I grew up in affordable housing here in the city and, uh, you know, I have a mom who's a cashier who's made, you know, 10 to $13 an hour at a local store market. Uh, and the reality is there are a lot of families, uh, particular single, single caretaker households who you know, are struggling. Uh, and I think while we are an innovation city and the, our community foundation uh, did a great report uh, highlighting this, um, we're filled with these tremendous resources uh, to put our heads together uh, across various sectors uh, to create a pilot like this uh, that could benefit uh, our residents. And so you know, we're working with MIT, we're working with Harvard, uh, we're working with, you know, our uh, many, you know, philanthropists in the community, uh, many corporations that exist, harnessing that, right, harnessing that. And so that does put us in a really unique position um, to help those who are really struggling. And so I think we, we do have, you know, having grown up here, it's my hometown, uh, we, people do think, you know, Cambridge is this wealthy city, that, uh, that is true. And um, we have so many people who are living um, in deep poverty who's, who are in crisis. Um, and it's generations of inequity and, and poverty that have been uh, passed down, especially in our BIPOC uh, communities. So I think um, for me in particular, and every, all our partners, you know, we're partnering with our Cambridge Housing Authority, and we're partnering with our key nonprofits, uh, COC, Just or Start. Uh, it's really this community effort, uh, this partnership that is, I think, very unique to Cambridge. And I think that's where, um, why some a demonstration here um, is also equally as powerful. Bob, um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, one concern people might have listening to this is that it's, uh, 
it's not a huge amount of money that is being dispensed on a monthly basis right now. And so the question is, when uh, Michael Tubbs talks about eradicating poverty, people might be going, well, you know, 200 to 400 or 500 bucks in Cambridge a month, uh, given housing costs, giving all these other pressures on people, is it really going to change people's lives or is it, is it meeting a need, an immediate need as it, as it appears to be doing in Chelsea? What do you say to that? I think people would be surprised at how two things. One is how far a family um, in need can make $400 stretch to support the many things that they need, right? You saw it in some of the data that Jeff presented. They do a lot of shopping at, uh, at wholesale clubs. They you know, find ways to stretch those dollars and, and, and make you know, we might think those of us that are better resourced might think that three or four hundred dollars is not a lot of money on a month by month basis. It, in fact, can be um, literally life saving uh, because um, it will help uh, fill needs that arise along the way that are unexpected um, and uh, and be able to uh, meet those needs in the immediate moment. So the, the first is, I think, don't underestimate the, the true value of three or four hundred dollars to a to a family uh, that is that, that might find themselves struggling. I, I, secondly, I think um, you know it is often that amount of money that is the, that forces a set of trade-offs about whether um, you know uh, college-age students in a family are able to go to college and not work at home, um, and we know or not work to support their home. Sorry. So we we know that that's. The right next step for economic opportunity is to try to access a post-secondary degree and and go on. But you know, families require their you know old enough to work young people sometimes to to come home and work uh, to support their families rather than go to school. Um, or you know, uh, that money can help uh, with car repairs or all kinds of things that 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 are that are part of building a successful and sustainable family life um, and one that can be, uh, you know, that can grow over time. So yes, it's not a, an immediate um, uh, solution to moving someone from poverty out of poverty or out of experiencing poverty, but just think about um, some of the things that get in the way when you don't have a couple of hundred dollars um, uh, of flexibility. Um, those are the things, those are some of those barriers that are alleviated that then all of a sudden um, can allow families to have a little bit more of a fuller and dignified opportunity for growth and success. So I'm going to, uh, we've gotten a load of questions from the audience uh, that, that want to ask questions. So I'm going to go a little bit early to doing some of that because some of them are directed to the panelists themselves. And Jeff, good, you're, you're on as well. Um, from Lori Siegel for, for Mayor Siddiqui, and this was a question that was asked in various forms by, uh, by other people as well. Do you see a problem, pr program like this being open to uh, any resident or just citizens? Uh, in What is it in Cambridge and, and how, how is that going to be structured? Sure. So in Cambridge, um, you know, CambridgeRise.org has more of the eligibility criteria and it's for any resident. We have um, particularly eligibility up to, you know, those who are making up to 80% of the area median income. And so, um, you know, we, we've we also been able to, within that, um, uh, weigh the sample. So the majority of those selected to enter into our lottery will earn up to 50% of the area median income, uh, which in Cambridge is, uh, for a household of two, is about 53,000. Uh, and so, um, we really want to focus the majority on that. So uh, we, you know, we want to get as much information um, about how these recurring monthly payments, which are $500 um, to the single caretaker families, you know, making 40,000 annually or, or 70,000 uh, annually. So that's, that's a little bit about the eligibility. And we chose up to 80% uh, to capture those families who are often, you know, not eligible to receive other city and state benefits. Uh, and resources, but are really still struggling to make uh, ends meet because the cost of living in Cambridge is uh, so high. 
Um, Sarah, um, you you uh, talked about the SNAP gap, and and one of our audience members is asking: Is there any connection between this program in Chelsea and SNAP benefits? In other words, I think what they're asking: uh, Does this cut into your federal benefits if you if you're getting money for food in this program? Does it curtail what maybe you might get under the federal program? Yeah, so for SNAP, any income that you get is, um, is supposed to be included in your application. So it might decrease your SNAP benefits. I think the reason why we started the SNAP gap initiative while the Chelsea Eats card was happening was that we didn't expect it to go on for this long. And we were trying to, like when the card expires and people's money ran out, to have them be able to use SNAP to purchase their food that way. Um, so, but the program has been going on for a lot longer than we expected. Okay, and here's a question from Pete Bonk. Um, he's, he says, I don't have numbers, but there's been discussion that because of the expanded unemployment benefits, some can bring in more dollars by not working versus going back to their old jobs. This was during the, the, the payments, the extra payments particularly that you were getting under in, during COVID. Um, he's asking, how does that fit in with today's discuss, discussion, human nature being what it is? Uh, Bob, why don't, why don't you tackle that one? Um, I, you know, having, having ex personally experienced what it's like to be in a family that um, has experienced poverty over the last uh, four or five decades of my life, I can tell you personally that no one would choose to live under the circumstances um, that is uh, being experienced by folks, even with the additional payments that they're receiving. Um, I, I do not believe that the phenomenon of uh, people are not going back to work uh, because they're getting these payments. I think what people are experiencing is that going back to work means going back to living in poverty, living with a substandard wage, um, and living in conditions that are not dignifying. And so I think what we need to start to do is rather than talk about whether or not this is keeping people from getting back to work, we need to have a conversation about how do we pay people in order to live in one of the most expensive regions of the world? Um, and how do we pay a wage that allows for them to support their families um, and, and not uh, try to uh, you know, obfuscate the, the, car, the real situation, which is um, we have not embraced the concept of paying people uh, what it takes to live a livable wage in this region. So Jeff, for you, here's a question. Did you see any confounding effects from the federal stimulus checks coming into the community as well? For instance, did you see less spending on food in those months and more on other sectors? Great question. Um, it won't confound the experiment because um, the randomization should, should ensure that uh, equal amounts of stimulus of checks were received in the treatment group and in the, in the, in the control group. Um, but I do expect us to find timing effects uh, of, of, for example, I, I expect that we'll see much more spending in the week immediately after the cards are replenished uh, than, than after and things like that, which almost everyone who has studied these kind of issues has, has found. Um, so it, it's a good question, but I, I, have, I, have, not, uh, I have not studied it uh, yet. But if, if I may, may I tell one story that builds on Bob's uh, comment uh, on, on um, uh, disincentives out of this program? There was one person in our sample who, was, who won the lottery, but then when it became time to pick up the card, he'd gotten the job between the time when he won the lottery and when he was picking up his card, and he actually turned down the card and said, please give it to someone else in Chelsea who needs it more. And so, mm. you know, this, this really had the feeling of people in, the, in, the, in, in Chelsea all trying to take care of each other in, in, in just an extraordinary way. So here's a question uh, maybe to Jeff or Sarah. When participants were introduced to the program, was there an emphasis on food spending or an emphasis that this money could be spent on anything they wanted to? In other words, what's the impact of how the program was framed initially? Great, it's a great question. I mean, we see an extraordinarily high fraction of these cards being spent on food, and we do not know whether the reason for that is that people have such extreme need for food. And of course, if you can't feed yourself, the first thing you're gonna spend money on is, is food. 
or to what extent because it was marketed as the Chelsea Eats program, even if people had the freedom to do whatever they want, they, for what in economics we would call a me mental accounting reason, caused people to spend the cards on food. And so we, we can't distinguish between those two stories here. Um, and here's a, um, to Mr. Ambrosino, uh, pretty nuts and bolts type question from J. William Semich. Uh, how are you able to prevent the sale of the cards to others? Yeah, I don't, there wasn't much incentive to sell the card because it was virtually the same as cash, given that you, there were no restrictions on where you could use this card. So I can't imagine too many circumstances where it was preferable to have cash than the card. I mean, maybe a few odd situations, but there wasn't much incentive to be selling this card because it was virtually the equivalent of cash. Um, and there's a lot of people that are asking Jeff, uh, when will you know sort of different outcomes for people uh, who won the lottery and those who didn't? I think they're wanting to know when your next phase of research is coming out. It, can you give us any hint about when that might be? I'm of course dying to know the answer as well. Um, you know, we've been working hard on this, um, but I, I think end of end of summer is probably when when uh, we will have made sense of, of all the data we've collected. Okay, um, we have a question from Jake Oliveira. Um, if it's uh, um, he's asking if this program is means tested, then what's the difference between giving people four hundred dollars a month on a debit card versus four hundred dollars in food stamps? Is it really guaranteed income or a welfare program by another name? Anyone wanna tackle that one? I would, I would just say the one difference really is the lack of restriction on this program. So food stamps do come with some restrictions as to what you can spend the money on. This was for food, but also for any kind of necessity. And if it was essential or for your mental health of your family to let your two children go to the movies and enjoy themselves once in a while, then that card was available for that. And for some families, that's a huge mental health boost. Yeah, and just to add on to that, Tom, there's also certain things you can't buy with food stamps, like cleaning and household supplies, which everyone needs during COVID. So those are like really necessities that folks might need, which they can't buy on food stamps. Um, let's see. Um, Ellen Gibson, to you, Mayor Siddiqui, is there a, a thought to convening, and it sounds like you've already convened community organizations in your community, but I think this is a broader organization of community organization to form a coalition to advocate this for this in future state budgets. What's the, I guess what they're asking is, Ellen is asking is what's the sort of political rollout of trying to move this forward? Or are you waiting for more research first? Is that something for maybe next year? Yeah, I think we've <clears throat> probably paved a really good um, path of what it could look like, what a broad coalition that could advocate to the state could look like because of our partnership with our housing authority and so forth. And, you know, to get the waivers and folks have mentioned um, this in the, the chat, working with Deborah Harris um, from uh, MRI and others, we, you know, went to DTA, um, we went to the Department of Early, um, you know, Childhood and Care and, and talk to them about this program. So it, that was all part of it. So I think some of that we've already done um, uh, on that level. And I think as we roll the pilot out, um, as we get more narrative, get more uh, data, uh, that will definitely paint um, more of a picture. But through this, you know, we contacted, uh, you know, one of our state reps, Marjorie Decker, we, we contacted Senator Saldi Domenico, everyone very supportive and um, uh, you know, very interested in, uh, in the topic and, you know, wanting uh, to move towards this direction. And so we've um, been really organized uh, already. And I think we've kind of, uh, we have a really great model on what it's looking like uh, to have a coalition in Cambridge. Um, and there's quite a few, um, I'm sorry, I'm sort of scrolling through. There's quite a few questions that have come in I think um, sort of concerns about, uh, we've sort of touched on this with food stamps, Sarah, but they're asking whether this affects your eligibility for Medicaid, uh, other programs. And I guess sort of what 
I'm reading into between these questions is uh, this is not a this cash payment is probably not a be all end all for everybody. It's got to be paired with other programs to sort of change people's life. Um, and if if they could all work together, then it would be effective. Uh, is that? But but I think that they're all asking, will this hurt eligibility for this or eligibility for that? What can you address that? Are are you familiar with that? Not a hundred percent familiar with that. Um, so I can't really. I'm sorry, I don't think I really have the answer for that. But I do think some, I think the larger thing that people might be wondering about also is like, how would this impact people's lives alongside other programs? I think it's important to think that, think about how Chelsea is a city where 22% of households are making $25,000 or less a year. And so having programs like Chelsea Eats in, in combination with Medicaid, in combination with affordable housing will allow families really not only the ability to afford their basic needs and to pay for housing and necessities like shampoo and conditioner, but also really gives them that extra bit of flexibility to have like smaller moments of joy and celebration and having fun, like going to the movie theaters, like Tom said, um, and joy, which we all deserve. You know, let me take a stab at that question. The, the short-term answer is that there've been waivers given to most of these pilots so that they didn't affect people's other benefits. But there's okay. a bigger long-term question, which is if you did this at scale, I mean, the, the, the existing programs have these awful interaction effects and cliffs and places where you know you're, you 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 earn ten thousand dollars more and you lose fifteen thousand dollars of benefits and it creates horrendous incentives. And I think one of the hopes of switching to a more coherent approach of giving Americans enough money to keep them out of poverty is to combine a bunch of these overlapping, not perfectly coordinated programs into something that was simpler for people to access and that doesn't have those kind of perverse incentives because of accidental um, uh, overlap of the income regions over which they get phased out. Mr. Ambrosino, in your description earlier, you described the program as it runs through, I think, the end of the summer and it's unsustainable uh, from, from your standpoint. Talk a little bit more about that. What is it? What is the cost? And uh, when you say use the word unsustainable, what do you mean? For a local government of the size of Chelsea, this program has a cost of $700,000 a month. So the program's been nine months. We've spent over $6 million on the program. That's not sustainable for a local government for one program. Uh, we've been able to do it because we've had, we've used some of our city reserve, we've used a little bit of federal care tax dollars, and we've gotten enormous philanthropic support from uh, the Shaw Family Foundation and the United Way, and that's made it possible, but that's not really sustainable to spend $700,000 a month for a city the size of Chelsea. And so these kinds of programs, at the scale we want to do it, that's really get to the majority of people who really are in poverty and need this kind of program, it really needs to come from the state and federal government. And um, Jeff, maybe you as an economist could sort of address, uh, I think when you were talking about universal basic income, it, you said it would require such an amount of money that you sort of wrote it off a little bit. Um, well, a lot. <laughs> uh, what kind of scale do you do you have any sense of what kind of scale we're talking about here and and what kind of money we, we'd be talking about we're, we're you know I, I want to agree with several people who spoke earlier that we are certainly a rich enough country that we should be ashamed about poverty and hunger uh, existing and so something that that's on the scale to um, substantially reduce or eliminate both poverty and hunger you know should be on the table here um, you know I, I SSI benefits should be more generous. SNAP should be more generous. Um, and then I think we need a solution to the problem that there are some economically vulnerable populations who are too unpopular to be eligible for our existing programs. And that can include people returning from prison. It can include um, uh, people with um, substance use issues. It can include people who are undocumented. And I think one of the things that's very appealing about this basic income movement is it might be a path toward local communities being given the freedom to target assistance 
to groups that really need it in their communities that can break out of some of this politics that makes it hard to, at a national level, help uh, some politically uh, unpopular uh, groups that really do need help. So is that, um, is that um, I guess I'm trying to channel, I'm not quite sure I'm making their argument for them, but critics of this, are they saying, oh, this is a socialism run amok in the United States? Or Bob, maybe you can address this. What, what, what obstacles do you encounter or what, what's the opposition say about this program and how do you counter that? The, the biggest obstacle is inertia, um, frankly. You know, we've been, we've been deploying benefits to millions of Americans for 40 or 50 years. This needs to be about reimagining that entire structure of which we're spending billions and billions of dollars on every single year already. Uh, so certainly a piece of this may be where do we need to do a little bit more and, and create some additive opportunities to bring more resources. And we are the wealthiest nation in the world. And, um, and we have, uh, um, you know, obviously room to, to think about how we might redistribute some of that, um, some of that wealth. But the first place I would go is let's make our current system work better and more effectively for the people who need those. Um, it is 100% um, as Mayor Tubbs said, poverty is a choice. We are making a choice as a country that our people will remain, some number of our people will remain in poverty when we know that there are, way, there are ways forward that could alleviate that. Hmm. And, and Mayor Siddiqui, um, so we talked a little bit about how Cambridge is often perceived as a wealthy community. One of our uh, listeners is asking, would you recommend that uh, communities across Massachusetts try this or is it, is it, does it depend on the community or should everybody, should every community be, be looking at it? You know, I think, uh, as I said earlier, I think many communities may not have the resources um, in the community to, to, to start a pilot. Um, and I think that's that's a problem, right? And I think that's where some of these communities, you know, I think of communities that I've worked in, Lowell, Lynn, Lawrence, um, you know, raising communities, they don't have that access. Uh, and I think that's where someone, you know, I wish we could, it could be a larger coalition of helping these cities as well. Um, because I do think it could make a huge difference um, in each of these cities. And so, yes, I, I think it's more also the, the will as well. Um, so it's the, that will to, to do something like this. Uh, and then it's also the resources. So um, if those cities can do both uh, and have both, um, I think it's really, really important. And I definitely would advocate it. Uh, but I think some cities will need just much more help than others. And so... And that's why I think hopefully um, doing more of these uh, demonstrations um, will give more evidence um, and then more power to allow some of these cities in Massachusetts to, to also do the same thing. Well, um, thank you to all our panelists and, and to Jeff Liebman for joining us today. And now I want to turn it over to Jill Shaw, the president of the Shaw Family Foundation, for a few closing remarks. Jill? Great, thank you, Bruce. Um, thank you for hosting this great discussion and thank you to all the panelists. And thank you all for joining us today. The Shaw Foundation partnered with Chelsea to help address intense food access issues while the pandemic was raging and conditions were unsafe and generally dire. We supported the Chelsea Guaranteed Income Program, giving cash directly to people in need because alongside other government supports like SNAP, and the USDA school food program, it was the most dignified, efficient, and impactful way to use our funds. To the question earlier from the audience on the impact of guaranteed income on SNAP, the cutoff for a family of four is over or over $4,400 a month. We're talking about guaranteed income for people living in poverty. $400 is not changing things enough to impact SNAP qualifications in nearly all cases regardless of the waiver, which was a terrific thing for the Department of Transitional Assistance to allow. Poverty existed long before the pandemic and will exist long after unless we do something about it. 
The Chelsea Eats research is proving as every well-researched guaranteed income program that has come before it has, that we can trust our neighbors, that here in our great state, in this country, life does not need to be a zero sum game, that we are all human and to create a net positive world advantageous to us all, we must lean into one another and expect that we will not fall, but rather fortify each other. Our country is changing faster than ever before. Technological advances are forever changing the way we exist in the world. And this coupled with a once in a generation pandemic has brought more uncertainty into everyone's lives. To address this uncertainty and to care for our most vulnerable neighbors in a world where anyone's sense of security can disappear in an instant requires a wholesale shift in how we think about the role of government in supporting individuals. What's so appealing to us about guaranteed income is that it's not a patchwork of complex programs wrapped in bureaucracy and each designed to address a narrowly tailored need with government mandated restrictions. It's a simple concept administered with virtually no red tape or administrative costs. It gets money, all money directly to people who need it most and empowers them to spend it in the way that most effectively meets their needs. It also may be the single most effective way to stimulate local economies at a time when that, as we all know, is more important than ever. Every single study has shown the exact same thing. When you give people direct cash assistance, they spend it on food and other necessities and they spend it immediately and locally. It's interesting that we see this idea gaining so much momentum right now across the country, specifically from mayors. These leaders who are on the ground in their communities are the ones who see both the immense need and the incredible potential of guaranteed income to, to address it. Right now there's more need than ever, but the good news is that there's also more money than ever to address it. The federal government, as you know, has given out trillions of dollars in state and local aid. Massachusetts alone has received $8 billion from the American Rescue Plan. As mayors around the state and around the country are thinking about how to most effectively spend this money, I hope that you'll look to your fellow mayors who spoke today and think deeply about guaranteed income. There is no better way to meet the needs of your communities while also giving your city's economy the shot in the arm that it needs to bounce back. And we need to advocate to the state and to the federal government for this together. It's time for a paradigm shift in the way that we think about each other and in the way that we use government dollars to help our most vulnerable neighbors. It's time for dignity, efficiency, personal choice, and trust. If philanthropy could carry the ball over the finish line here, we would do it, but we need our government partners to join us. If you're interested in learning more or in getting in touch with us, please go to shawfoundation.org. It's S-H-A-H -H foundation.org. Thank you everyone again for tuning in. Thank you for your time and for your interest in this work. This concludes our event. Have a great afternoon.